personal level, okay, number one, what led you to personal development? What led you to become a professional development speaker, professional? Uh, my struggle led me to personal development. Hard times, rock bottom led me to personal development. Um, like I've said many a times, I didn't know who Tony Robbins, Zig Ziglar, Les Brown was. Like I've seen Les Brown before. My mom used to watch him, but I didn't know who these people were at all. Like my mentors were literally like Tupac, like Lil Wayne, like I'm a hip hop kid. I was raised on hip hop. That was my mentor. So even though still like, I feel like that's a way of personal development through music for sure. But I wasn't into like reading books at all. Like you couldn't get me to read a book. I thought reading a book was corny. But it was my struggle, it was my rock bottom. It was me knowing that in order to get to a new place in my life, I had to do something different. In order to grow, I had to obtain knowledge that I didn't have. So I picked up a John Maxwell book. I picked up some books. I went to the library. I started researching on YouTube. I started checking out Les Brown. And uh, I got into this space of growth. And it literally changed my life. And as far as me being a speaker, it just speaking found me. You know, even to this day, I don't even consider myself a professional motivational speaker because I was never trained. I never went to certain classes like I just spoke my heart and I just came from the purest place I could ever come from. And it's worked for me. Right. It's worked for me. I've connected with people in a powerful way. And uh, it was it was actually a friend of mine challenging me. You know, I wanted to be a rapper. I was actually a rapper. And that's what I wanted to do. But it was a friend of mine challenging me to get on the stage and I didn't want to do it. It was my biggest fear, like a lot of people in the world. And I did it and it changed my life. You know, I stepped outside my comfort zone. I stepped into my fear. And even in that moment, like understanding that and thinking about, man, how many people in the world like are allowing fear? Like just imagine if I wouldn't allow my fear to paralyze my life, I would have never walked into this. And so that's why I'm even like more adamant of, uh, about helping people because I know what it did for me. Right. I know how it changed my life. And so I want to help other people do the same thing. Number two, how do you stay sharp in the industry? That is, who, do, who or what do you turn to for advice and continue education? Um, I stay sharp by getting around people who make me feel uncomfortable. I stay sharp by exposing myself. What I mean by that is saying like what I'm struggling with, what I'm not good at, like what I need help in. And I get around people who are better than me. You know, as they say, if you're the best in the room, like you need to find a different crew. You know, so I'm, I'm willing to get around more creative people than me. I'm willing to get around more knowledgeable people than me in certain areas. I'm willing to go to masterminds and do all these things just to get in rooms. Because I know if I'm in that room, if I'm, if I'm at the bottom of the totem pole in that room, I have no choice but to move up. I have no choice but to grow. But a lot of people never do that because their pride and their ego gets in the way. I don't care about pride and ego because I know pride and ego will paralyze your growth. Right. And so I'm always like, hey, humble yourself. Get yourself around people who force you to level up, who force you outside your comfort zone and hold and, and who also, you know, hold you accountable. So I'm always seeking that. I call them growth environment. So that's what helps me grow. That's what helps me, you know, further my education, you know, just by those connections in that network. Number three, personal development is personal. That being said, do you believe that there are certain practices that could benefit everyone? You know, what are they? Uh, yeah, I would say, you know, one practice is protecting your peace. Um, I tell people all the time, like, this is something that is very important. You know, self-care, self-care is necessary, especially in the time that we're in now, especially when, you know, social media is connecting us more than ever to everybody else. But in a weird way, it has the power, if you let it, to disconnect you from what matters the most. And so you have a lot of people who are drained. You have a lot of people who are extended. You have a lot of people who are empty because they're always going. They're always doing. They're always providing. They're always serving. And they're not taking any time for themselves. And so protecting your peace means that you're disconnecting from the world and reconnecting with your soul and with yourself. Whatever that means. For me, that means going out in nature, on trails. For me, that means meditation. For me, that means, you know, sitting in my backyard, uh, getting up an hour earlier when everybody sleep just to just release, you know, just to release any tension I have in my life, just to be grateful, just to be thankful. So my protect your peace uh, practice um, not only has changed my lives, but I know it's changed thousands of others also that have applied it. Number four, how do you differ? How do you differ? Oh, I can't even say that word. <laughs> 
<laughs> How are you different from other speakers, authors, and podcasters who may have similar content? Uh, I think I'm different because I'm me. You know, um, I'm a person that, you know, when it wasn't popular for me being who I am, like I'm a black guy, you know, with dreads, tattoos, you know, urban, you know, I don't talk proper. And this was taboo at one point in this industry, if we being real about it. Like when I first started, everybody had suits and ties on, you know, wasn't nobody wearing no snapback hat, you know, a hoodie on stage or some shoes. I remember I got criticized for it. I had one lady telling me that I didn't look professional enough and I told her, well, I'm purposeful enough. And I think, I'm not saying that what makes me different than other people, but I've always like been myself. I'm always being straight up no matter where I'm at. I'm not gonna ever sugarcoat anything. I'm gonna just bring it, you know, just raw and real from the heart. And I think people feel that and resonate with that. Not saying other people don't do it, but I just know that's, the, that's my superpower. That's the thing where, when I ask people like, what do you connect with me most? Everybody says, Trent is just cause you're real. And so, uh, yeah, I think that's what, you know, my superpower is. Number five, what advice would you give to someone trying to filter through good and bad PD? Um, I would just tell you this, like, I'm not gonna say what's good and bad, but it's like, if you gotta question it, like if it don't connect with you, then it's probably not coming from a real place. And I could be wrong in that assumption, but it's probably not. And I would say like, if you're following someone who never shares any of their like struggle, like at all, right? It's always perfection, perfection, perfection. Then to me, that's a red flag because not saying everybody has to share their every struggle of life, but if they never shared anything personal, anything that they, they, they are going through currently, like a lot of people like to talk about their past story, but don't many people like to bring up their you know, their struggle right now because most people don't do that because they don't want the consumer to think that they don't have it all together. But what most people don't realize is that people connect more with you when you show that you don't have it all together, when you show your process, when you show what you're doing to get out of your struggle. So to the people out there, if the person never shares any struggle or anything, then that would raise a red flag for me straight up. What do you believe to be the most beneficial daily habit? Appreciation, simple. Appreciate life. Appreciation is the first step to elevation. If you can find appreciation, even in your storm, even in your sunshine, your highs, your lows, then you got it. Because appreciation will carry you through. Most people don't appreciate their life because they're too focused on what's going wrong, too focused on what they gotta fix. So wake up, Appreciate everything in your life because everything has purpose, even the bad. When I look back on my life, the things that were bad, actually that redirection set me up for what was meant for my life, right? That uncomfortable path that I didn't want to go down was perfect for my life. And so I just learned to appreciate everything. Number seven, how do you evaluate your own personal development? How do you ensure accountability. Uh, I check myself. You know, I've been a, a professional athlete, you know, for, or just an athlete in general for, you know, over half of my life. And accountability is big because if you, if you don't do it, it's going to show, you're going to get exposed. And I think it's the same way in this space. Uh, eventually what you don't do will get exposed. The fruit will always show. So you can preach health all you want, but if you ain't taking care of your health, it will get exposed. You know, you can preach anything. If you're not practicing it, it will get exposed. And so I don't want to get exposed in a negative way. And also I know that I'm an influence for people. So if I'm not living it, then basically I'm giving other people the excuse not to live it also. So my accountability is myself for one. I have people around me to hold me accountable and my community rehabbers across the world. You know, I always put things out and say, Hey, this is what I'm about to do. Hold me accountable to it. Like I want y'all to check me if I'm slipping. And so I'm not afraid I'm not afraid of, of someone telling me what to fix because I know that that only can better my life. Uh, number eight, how do you see your message and approach evolving over the next 10 years? Uh, I see it being even more straight up and realer. I see it being, you know, I think I'll have more tools. Uh, you know, I'll be about 45 years old, so I have more experience with life. Uh, definitely have more knowledge, so you're definitely gonna get more of that. 
but I plan to still be creative. I still plan to push the, uh, the envelope. I still, you know, plan to talk about things that most people won't talk about. Like, I plan to do all that. So whatever you see me doing right now, you can times that times 10, and that's where we'll be at in 10 years. Number nine, what do you wish your audience paid more attention to right now? Um, I wish my audience paid more attention to themselves. Not in a selfish way, but like I feel like we're always on our phone. We're always like critiquing other people. It's like we're watching the game. Like we're in the stands watching the game. I feel like so many people are watching other people play their game of life and you're critiquing it. Or when they fail, it makes you feel better about yourself because it's like, oh, they failed. And so I feel better. Or when they're succeeding, you feel less about yourself. And you're always focused on them. Focus on yourself for a bit. Right? I wish my audience paid more attention to like realizing that, man, I actually can make a change in my life. I actually can have this setback be my, you know, propel my comeback. I actually can have this, you know, what was supposed to break me to actually build me up. But that takes self-awareness. That takes uh, self-accountability. And it takes someone being honest with themselves. So stop pointing the finger, stop looking out, and start pointing the thumb and looking, and looking within because that's where change starts. It all starts with you. Uh, okay, number 10. When did you know you were on the right track in this line of work? Did you have an experience and meet someone that was especially rewarding for you? Man, you know, I knew it. I knew it when I got off that stage the first time with these kids. Like, it was a feeling that I couldn't explain. Like, wasn't no doors open for me then, like wasn't nobody watching no videos, but I just knew it. But to say an exact experience, um, I would say two. One, when I went to Sweden for the first time and I realized like people in Sweden, first time out the country, people in Sweden knew my videos. So I'm like, okay, this is crazy. Like I'm in Sweden out of all places and people know what rehab time is. I'm like walking the streets of Stockholm and, and people are stopping me, it's crazy. A more powerful, um, encounter would be after one of my live conversations events, this was an event that I did where later I rent out like a, anywhere, like a, it could be a library, somebody's house, <laughs> like anywhere. And I would have like 10 people over there and we would talk. And after the event, this lady comes up to me, she says, Trent, like with tears in her eyes, she says, Trent, uh, this is back like in 2013. Uh, you don't know me, but I want to tell you, and I remember exactly what live she was talking about. She's like, you went live uh, like a few months ago, like a half a year ago. And that live saved my life. You don't know that I was actually on the bridge about to jump and I was literally getting on Facebook to say my goodbyes. I was gonna write like a message on Facebook and press send, turn off my phone and jump. Uh, but when I got on Facebook, I saw your video and your video literally, you know, stopped me, you know, what you said that day. And her sons came up to me after too, and they hugged me and they were crying. It's like, man, you helped save my mother. And that's when I realized, man, that what I'm doing and what everybody else is doing in this space that's literally like using their struggle to help people, it's bigger than you ever would imagine. Like you can't measure impact, you can't. And that's something that I remind myself very often. Like I would never know how much of an impact I've actually made in this world, never. And so I always just say, just keep giving impact, keep giving impact no matter what. But uh, that encounter like shook me to the core and made me realize like this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Lightning round. Question number one. What is one book you gift most often? The Greatest You by me. <laughs> number two. What are you reading right now? I am reading Outliers by actually listening to it, but Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Great book. Number three. What is the greatest piece of advice you've received? Um, man, that's like a lot, but one that comes to mind right now is forever could end tomorrow. And yeah, I think you guys get that. Number four, what's the first thing you do when you wake up? Thank God, straight up. Number five, what's your favorite, favorite guilty pleasure? Uh, wing stop, lemon pepper. And they got lemon pepper now on the fries too. And you can, man, yeah, that's my guilty pleasure, guys. Like for real. Like I, I literally have to go run some miles to earn that meal. Number six, where's your favorite place to find solitude? In nature. I'm a nature head. Like, let's, like, let me be clear. 
like I love nature, but I don't love the things in nature. Like I don't like snakes and all that type of stuff, but I love nature. I feel like nature is God's natural medicine for the, for the soul and nature heals like totally. So you can find me somewhere in, on a hike in some woods somewhere. That's where you'll find me. And number seven, excluding yourself, who is your favorite and most respected personal development professional? Y'all gonna put me on the spot with this. Uh, man, I gotta go. There's a lot. Like, I'm gonna just name off a few, okay? Like, uh, Rachel Hollis and Dave Hollis, the Hollis Company, uh, dear friends of mine. I love what they do, I love what they stand for, and I love who they are off stage. You know, that's beautiful. Uh, Brendan Bruchard is one, Dean Graziosi is another, Ed Marlette, uh, you know, everybody that we're interviewing in this, in this, uh, on this episode or magazine cover. So, so many people, man. But if I had to pick one, I would say the Hollis Company. Uh, Rachel and Dave, I love what they're doing, uh, how they built it from social media. You know, I can relate to that so much and, you know, it's cool. So let's get it. Actually, let me do this last question again. Because I got someone better, actually. Uh, the last question is, let me see. All right, seven, excluding myself, who's your favorite and most respected personal development professional? That's tough, man, because there are a lot of great people. Everybody, you know, that is on this cover is great. Um, you know, but I would have to say, you know, I'm gonna go with someone that's legendary is Les Brown. Uh, just for the simple fact, you know, I'm a you know, African American man. And so to see him and what he did and how he trailblazed it and, you know, what he's still doing to this day, like it's inspiration. I got a chance to actually speak on the same stage as him and got to meet him and to see him still going, you know, after everything he's been through, you know, health wise, it's totally incredible. So shout out to Les Brown, man, I, he's, he's, he made it possible you know, for, for people like me. So straight up, that's it.